Stuart Firestein, how many brain cells do we have? Well, that's a good question. We used to think 100 billion. That number hung around for ages. It's in all the textbooks. But then a couple of years ago, uh, a young neuroanatomist in, um, in Brazil called, uh, sent an, e an email around asking how many brain cells people thought we had, all of us who taught neuroscience, and where we got that number from. And everybody, of course, wrote back 100 billion and also wrote back, I have no idea where that number comes from. It's just in all the books. So she had developed a new method of counting brain cells. It's actually not a trivial problem to count brain cells, and to count anything that's a several hundred, uh, several billions anyway, several tens of billions. So, but she developed a new method that was very interesting, which we didn't go into so much, and she recounted them and found that there were, in fact, only 80 billion. Now, I mean, that's an order of magnitude okay, so it's not that big a difference. The larger difference might have been that we thought we had 10 times as many so-called glial cells, which are the packing cells of the brain, the non-brain cell parts of the brain that keep it all together. In fact, the word glia means glue from the Greek. And we thought we had 10 times as many a thousand billion uh, glial cells, and it turns out we only have about 80 billion of those as well. So in one fell swoop, we lost 120 billion cells in the brain. But, you know. <laughs> but, so what don't we know? Oh, well, that's an awfully big question. As I point out, knowledge is a big question, but ignorance is a much bigger question. I think the question is not only what don't we know, but what don't we know that we don't know? Uh, Donald Rumsfeld. Is, yes, the, the famous Donald Rumsfeld quote. So sorry he got to that before I did, but, but there it is. But he was, very, he was absolutely correct in saying that, although he sounded a bit befuddled when he did because he was all worried about a war that wasn't going so well. But in point of fact, that's really a good question. Are there limits to our ignorance? Because that's a more important limit in a way than a limit to our knowledge. You say in your book, Ignorance, that when you get together with other scientists, you talk about things you don't know rather than sure. things you do know. Sure. Uh, my favorite quote is from Marie Curie, who, uh, upon gaining her second graduate degree, no less, wrote a letter to her brother that said something to the effect of, one never seems to notice what's been done. One only cares about what remains to be done. And I think that's the attitude that drives scientists along, that gets us into the lab early in the morning and keeps us there late at night and moves us along. We don't really care so much about what everybody knows. That's done now. Let's get on to the next thing. What don't we know? What do we need to know? What, why do we need to know it? What would be the next best thing to know? So forth. Page 28 of Ignorance, George Bernard Shaw, uh, yes. in a toast at a dinner, fetting Albert Einstein proclaimed, science is always wrong. It never solves a problem without creating 10 more. Yes, and I think I say, isn't that glorious? In there, you do, right? you do. Yes. Which I think it is. I mean, I think that's exactly the right description of science. Absolutely. By the way, I should say that I believe George Bernard Shaw cribbed that from Immanuel Kant, just to name drop a little bit, who, who years before that had, had come up with this idea of pre question propagation, the principle of question propagation, that every answer begets more questions. Do scientists rest on their laurels after a while? Well, I guess everybody rests on their laurels after some point. Um, I think resting on laurels is a dangerous thing for science to do because those, la those laurels tend not to be all that, um, all that foundational, all that strong a foundation. I think one of the things that probably the public recognizes least about science is that we tend to have less regard for facts than I think is generally thought to be the case. That scientists, although we work for facts, we work to get data, we also realize that they're the most malleable, the least reliable part of the whole operation. That whatever you find today will surely be superseded in some way or another, revised, overturned completely in the worst case, but certainly revised by the next generation of scientists with the next generation of tools. Thus it's always been in the past 400 years or for 14 generations, it's what we've done. And I think we welcome it. Science is revision. We welcome revision. Revision in science is a victory. You write in here that science and nature magazines are very important for scientists to get published in, but if you were going to recommend 
to your students to, to read those, you'd recommend not reading last issue, but 10 years ago. Yes, well, Why? I mean, I, I think they should read this issue, too, to stay current. But, but quite often what will happen is the graduates will come rushing into the lab with this week's Nature, which has some great set of experiments in it, suggesting that, ah, now I can see what the next experiment is. Let's get to work on this. We'll get our Nature paper. And, of course, I know that the people who wrote that paper have already done the next experiment, the next 10 experiments, or at least thought of them. And that um, the real place to go often for ignorance, for good ignorance, for high quality ignorance, are the papers that were published 10 or 15 years ago in Nature. High quality papers, the leading papers of the day, but which couldn't have asked certain questions because we didn't know them to ask yet. They didn't have the technology or the tools that have developed in the last 10 or 15 years. And so they're ripe to be revisited. Has technology helped in discovering science? Sure, technology is a critical part of the whole arrangement. I mean, this is often science drives, science questions drive technology, and technology then goes ahead and drives science. So instrumentation has always been a critical part of science since Galileo and the telescope really began it all some 400 and some odd years ago. Besides a number of brain cells, Professor Firestein, what's another What's another fact that we knew that has changed over oh, the last well, there, couple of years? a bunch of those. I guess my favorite one, because my laboratory happens to research taste and smell, the senses of taste and smell, and so we work on that, what are called the chemical senses. And so we work on that, and one of the, one of the best known um, facts, that's not a fact there, is the so-called taste map, which you'll find in every high school and college and medical school textbook, and most people believe that there's a map of sensitivity on your tongue and that you taste uh, sweet things with the tip of your tongue and sweet and sour things on the sides and bitter in the back. And this is completely untrue. It's a, uh, it's a mistranslation of an anecdotal, a very anecdotal report by a German physiology professor in the early 1900s which was picked up by a well-known psychology professor in the 1940s named, of all things, Boring. So his book is called Psychology, and under it says boring. You can imagine this is a joke for many generations of undergraduates. But he put this in his book as if it were, in fact, a complete fact, a well-studied fact. And apparently it was a mistranslation, and it just stood the test of time somehow or another, even though it's totally wrong. What has stood the test of time uh, from three, four, five hundred years ago? Well, so many things do, but maybe not in their original form. So, I mean, certainly Newton has stood the test of time. Newton continues to work. Uh, we can launch space shuttles and build bridges and all the rest of this sort of thing using Newton's laws of gravity and force and so forth and so on. Um, but they've been revised significantly, most notably by Einstein and many scientists since Einstein. And so they've been changed. But I guess the way we say it is that that the regime in which Newton's uh, proposals were made and were true, they're still true within that regime. What's changed in a way is the regime. We've expanded the regime. So now uh, Newton's formulations work as long as you don't travel at something near the speed of light, which we don't do very often, mind you, so they're pretty workable. But when you begin to travel near the speed of light, you have to invoke Einstein's relativity. And we do do that. So for example, our GPS devices, which send signals to satellites and back at the speed of light, need to be adjusted by Einstein's relativity in order to work properly. Otherwise, they'd be 50 meters or so off all the time. Albert Einstein has stood up. Okay. Albert Einstein has certainly stood up so far, yes, although Einstein wasn't so sure it was going to stand up. He had a couple of fudges here and there, which turned out he, he claimed were a, uh, one of the biggest mistakes he's made, the cosmological constant, but now it's come back. Um, Unfortunately, he doesn't know that, but it's come back and now seems to be very important. But so far, Einstein seems to have stood the test of time, but you know, it's only been a century. What's your class called? Well, my class is called <laughs> Ignorance as well, and I, it's a great treasure to be able to teach at a place like Columbia University where they let you run a class in Ignorance <laughs> and have students enroll for it and put it on their transcript. Um, the class started about five or six years ago, and I think it was in 2006, and it was based on my feeling that I was doing students a disservice. I was being a diligent teacher, giving them 25 lectures a year in neuroscience, cell and molecular neuroscience, was the forbidding title of the course, and using this textbook that I'm fond of. It's one of the leading textbooks in the field by Eric Kandel and his 
colleagues. And, but I'm fond of pointing out this textbook weighed, I weighed it, it weighs seven and a half pounds, which is twice the weight of a normal human brain. So it's about the brain, so that can't be right. So, and I think that the students had gotten the idea by the end of the course that, that everything was known about neuroscience, and that's certainly not true. And that the way we kept track of what we know about neuroscience is we build up a lot of facts and we stick them in these encyclopedic books, and that's not true. Um, we don't really know much about the brain yet at all. We don't even know what we don't know about the brain in some ways. We're still finding marvelous things out about